everybody, and welcome to our next summer virtual series. Again, my name is Tara Stevenson. I serve as the Interim Vice President of Student Affairs, and I am excited to continue our journey through academics this week. We got to dive in, see behind the curtain of academic advising last week with our Center for Advising and Core Experience, and we got quite a few questions about what it means to build a schedule and what goes into it. And so this week we are really diving into the core experience and what that means here at Flagler. As um, a couple of housekeeping items before we dive in, we have been recording all of these sessions and we just sent your students a newsletter this past Monday with a link to all of them. So they're gonna be posted as we get those recordings for everybody to see on the Flagler College YouTube channel. There's a playlist on there for everybody. Um, we do have the Q&A, so make sure that you use that. It should be at the bottom or somewhere on your Zoom screen, whether you're logging in on your computer or your phone, um, but we'll be monitoring that and hopefully able to answer all those questions throughout the session. We'll have contact information at the end, so if you'd like some more one-on-one -on -one discussion with our presenters, you can reach out to them. But without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to our amazing group today and uh, take us take us on this deep journey. Uh, thank you so much, Tara. Um, so. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Doug Keaton. I'm the uh, director of our core program here at Flagler College. And what I'd like to do is invite our other panelists to introduce themselves. I'll, I'll just say a quick further word about myself. I've been here since 2012. Uh, for most of that time, I was a professor of philosophy. In the past few years, I've taken on sort of additional administrative role of uh, being the point person for our gen ed program, which is one of the things we'll be talking about with you tonight. Um, and with that, I'll pass off to uh, Dr. Thweet. So, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Janine Thweet. I actually work um, in the Center for Advising and Core Experience as a first year advisor. Um, I work mostly with the humanities and natural science majors, but I also have the joy of working with all of our undeclared students. So, if your student is an undecided student, I have the joy of being their academic advisor or as long as they remain undecided. Um, but one of my extra duties in the case office is to act as a kind of liaison with the core curriculum and the core department. And so I'm here to talk specifically about how um, advising and core intersect. Over to you, Jeanette. Hi, my name is Dr. Jeanette Vigilotti, and I am an assistant professor in the Classical and Liberal Education Department, um, and also the core coordinator of our general education program. I am also a Flagler alum, and uh, my the classes that I teach that your students might encounter me in is our literacies of historical inquiry, creativity, um, academic writing. So we'll say more about those things soon. Wonderful. I think we've got a presentation to maybe share for you all while we're chatting. So, Doug, I'm going to share my screen with our PowerPoint. And if you will kind of MC as we go, if you go off track, I will find the proper slide and match it up. So go for it and don't worry about it. Uh, sounds great. Thank you so much. So what we're talking about today is essentially uh, the core program at Flagler College. Now, uh, Colleges and universities around the country have these things called general education programs, which they uh, ask their students to complete in addition to the majors and minors that they take while they are students. The purpose at any school of a general education program is to provide students with a, a more broad-based education than they would get strictly from their majors or minors. And the, the cool thing about a general education program is it provides an opportunity for the college to really put their stamp on what it means for a student to be a graduate of Flagler College versus uh, University of Florida versus Stetson versus any of the other various colleges around the country. Um, if I could just put this really briefly, there's basically two ways to create a general education system. You can either, on the one hand, ask your students to take a bunch of classes in addition to their major 
that they were taking, that the professors were teaching uh, anyway, classes like Psychology 101 or History 101. So let's say you're a business major and the, and the college says, okay, you can get your major in business, but we also want you to take some 101 classes and other disciplines to get a more broad-based uh, education. Um, that's one way of doing it. It's a pretty common way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to have the school specifically design classes just for the general education program. That is to sit down and, and have the faculty think thoughtfully about what skills or, or what kinds of knowledge do we want all of our graduates to have that they all have in common as graduates of this particular school. Now, the nice thing about the first way of doing it with the one-on-one -on -one classes is it generally gives students lots of different choices, which is which is great because students can say, well, look, I'm majoring in business, but I'm really interested in psychology. So I'll take psych one-on-one -on -one as a gen ed course, and that'll be great. Um, the downside of that first way of doing it with the one-on-one -on -one classes is that there's kind of not a lot of point to it. Um, there's no theme. There's no philosophy behind it. Essentially, the school just says, look, in addition to your major, go out and take a bunch of classes and we hope you get something out of it. So the second way of doing it, which is sometimes called a core system that I just mentioned, is the idea of having specially curated, specially designed classes that the students take that really puts the stamp on the kind of education they get from that school. Uh, the nice thing about that is it lets the school develop a philosophy and a theme and like an idea behind what they want their graduates to have. The downside is, is that it does not seem to have a lot of choice involved. Like all the students have to take this same sequence of special classes that the school has made in addition to their majors and minors. The thing we did here at Flagler, and this really makes our system special and it's something we're proud of, is we combine the best of both, wor both worlds with that with our system. We have a core experience in which all students come to Flagler as new students, and they take uh, a set of classes that are intended to convey a skill set, a thinking skill set, that we believe is essential to a 21st century college graduate. But those skills that we want all of our students to have are packaged within a range of originally designed and creative options for students to choose from. So for example, one of the skills that we want our students to have is the ability to think about problems from an historical point of view, to think about as problem solvers, what's the history of this problem? How did it come to be this way? And how can we solve it? And that's a kind of learning how to do history. So that's the skill we want our students to have among a range of other skills. To convey that skill, students have a choice of taking a class called, let's say, um, history detectives, or a class called uh, Science on the Screen, which is a class about the history of science uh, in movies. And we have a class called um, uh, Ant Antiquities of the Ancient World for students who might be especially interested in like ancient Greece and Rome and places like that. And we have a class much more contemporary who focuses on the question of, let's say, like the history of Ukraine, things like that. And the idea is that we give a wide range of choices. There's like a hundred different choices for students to pick, all of which are intended to convey one of these key skills that we think our students ought to have. So when I say the best of both worlds, what I mean is we combine what we hope is um, a wide range of choices, but still a concentrated focused skill set that puts a stamp on what we mean by a Flagler College education that all of our students have in common. We spent a few years designing this. We put a lot of thought into it and we're really quite proud of it. Now, this core system is part of what we're gonna talk about with you today. And there's several different elements to it, all of which we have thought carefully about and we designed to be engaging and helpful for the students as they shape their college careers. And that's what we're gonna be talking about um, over the course of the next of the next several of the, of the session. So, um, Jeanette, do you have anything further to add about the nature of our core program? I think that, sorry, one of the things that students really appreciate once they are at Flagler and they have started in their college experience is the core classes because there are, it's a really beautiful way to marry interests with skills. And I think students can really see the skills that they're gonna take away that they can apply to jobs that they are going to have both in college and beyond college. So it really gives them the language that they need to be successful. Yeah, I think that that's an excellent way to put it, that uh, the faculty 
you know, again, spent a couple of years thinking about this and developed a set of nine skills, nine thinking skills that we think are essential for anyone as a college graduate to have as they enter the 21st century. Sometimes we say, these are the skills a person needs to have to be a truly free thinker, to be able to think for themselves. And you can see on the screen there what they are. Writing, communication, natural science, social science, quantitative reasoning, creativity, social and cultural inquiry, historical inquiry, and ethical reasoning. Now, what that means is, when I say a free thinker, what I mean is later in life, let's suppose a student is confronted with a problem. Um, it's great to be able to approach that problem from several different angles, to, th to think about it like a social scientist, to think about it like an artist, to think about it like an historian. And so that's what these classes are intended to convey. So to be a little bit more specific, the classes that we teach in the core are what we call skill-based, not content-based. And what I mean by that is if again, we take historical inquiry as our example, the goal of one of our core history classes is not to memorize a long list of dates. It's rather to teach the students how to generate historical explanations and to look at problems from an historical point of view. So one of the classes, for example, called History Detectives uh, asks the question, for example, uh, why did Russia invade the Ukraine? And then over the course of the semester, investigates the history of Russia and the history of Ukraine to provide an explanation for why that event occurred. And then at the end of the semester, the students are required to, in a presentation, a public presentation, offer their version, their answer to the question, why did Russia invade the Ukraine? And the goal there is to show the students what it means to give a responsible and informed answer to that using primary and secondary sources so that uh, later in life, when they're confronted with problems, they can address them as historians in that sense. And then the creativity skill does similar things for approaching a problem like an artist. Quantitative reasoning means approaching it like a statistician and so on. The idea being that to be a truly free thinker, you have to be able to think in more than one way. After all, if when you're confronted with a problem, you only have one way of thinking about it, you're not really very free in the way that you respond to it. So we want our, our, our students to have a real toolkit when they enter the world after graduation, no matter what they're majoring in. So you can see on the left of the screen there, our core classes help students to shape the meaning of their college education while at the same time providing this foundation of carefully curated skills. Uh, Dr. Thweet, when you're talking with students about this course system, um, what kinds of questions do they tend to have and what do you tend to tell them? Well, um, I'm getting lots of those questions these days. Um, so I'm going to start with um, some of the most common and some of the most basic. Um, so one question I get a lot is um, some version of, I thought I'd be taking like basic writing and math, but I don't see any writing and math on my schedule. I just see all this core stuff. Um, and then, right, I have the opportunity to explain that, well, in fact, you are taking writing and you are taking math, um, then they are called core classes at Flagler. So if you also are wondering about that as you're looking at right the schedule that your student has received or will be receiving over the next month, um, you can see on the screen that academic writing is one of our essential core skills. And when that shows up on your student's schedule, it will show up in the form of COR 101, 102, 103, or 104. That is our academic writing set of course codes. So if you see that on the schedule, why yes, um, your student will be practicing the essential skill of academic writing. Similarly for math, um, quantitative reasoning is one of our essential skills in the core. So that is a math class, that is statistics, and that will show up on the schedule as core 141, 142, 143, or 144. Um, so that's a very, very common question that I get a lot. Um, I don't know if we want to segue right into what we call our core bingo chart, um, but I'm happy to go ahead and do that if if that makes sense. I, I right, think so it's a really great segue because we do have one question that's come in is, are these core classes assigned randomly? Like, how do we determine which student gets what class? And I think this screen is going to really help answer some of those questions. Um, they're certainly not random. Um, 
every case advisor builds, I, I call this a provisional schedule because it is, in our minds, a starting point for further conversation. We have learned that it's um, much easier for both us and for our incoming students to give them a starting place rather than simply saying, here's how you build a schedule, here are the required courses, okay, good luck, go for it. Um, and then right, working to make sure that, that everything is correct and everything is appropriate. Um, if we say, here's a schedule, tell me what you like and don't like, and we'll change it from there. Um, that is simply an easier process for all of us. So we have shifted to that mode of doing things. When we make that provisional schedule, we take into account everything that we already know about your student. So um, if we have a major declared, if we know that your student has an interest in a potential minor, um, we will take that into account and get your student into one of those foundational intro courses for that major, or maybe even for that minor as well. Um, we do ask students to fill out a quick survey for us that tells us all sorts of things. Are you a morning person? Are you going to make it to that 8 a.m. class? Are you not? Um, do you want breaks in between all your classes? Or do you want to arrange your classes in a block and then have the rest of your day free? Um, we ask about previous college coursework. Are you bringing in any credit? Um, we try to gather as much information as we can, and then we take all of that information into account as we're building that starting point. But we know we're not going to get it 100% right 100% of the time. So if there is something that a student wants to change, we like practically beg them, please reach out to us. You can call, you can email, you can book a Zoom appointment. We're here for you. Um, happily, I feel like I'm getting a lot of outreach from students this summer, more than last year. So this incoming cohort seems a little bit bolder, which is lovely. Um, we do not mind this. So. If, if there's some anxiety on the student's part about reaching out, please, please reassure your students. These people are lovely and they want to help you, but they can't help you unless they know you want help. So tell them, reach out, click that link, make that appointment. So and it is not random. Guests, so I'm so sorry to interrupt, but for those guests that sat with us last week with the um, Sarah Upchurch from the case office, you know, they got to hear that same thing. And she really went through that why of why we work with students one on one to change the schedules, because, you know, this chart can be a little daunting at first glance. And we want to make sure that our students are making intentional class choices. So what I want to do, and I clicked this out of the slideshow view, because I actually want to um, draw on my screen while I'm talking so that you guys can see Literally, this is how I use this chart when I sit down with a student to advise them and tell them how the core works. So when I sit down with a student and I look at their transcript and say, okay, here are the courses that you've taken. What courses could we plan on for your next semester? I will do it this way. So, okay, in your first semester, everyone takes first year seminar. So I circle it. And almost everyone will take an academic writing course. Most students will do that in the fall semester. If we don't put them in a core academic writing in the fall, we prioritize it for the spring. So we really want everyone to get the core academic writing done in the first year. So say we put your student in a core 102, so I circle that. And then maybe they're um, interested in coastal environmental science as their major, so I'm gonna put them in um, core 124, which is our core natural scientific inquiry course. And if they're doing coastal environmental science, they also are going to need a lot of math. So I'm going to get them started on math. Maybe I'll put them in whatever algebra sequence is appropriate to them, but also they might want to get started on statistics. So let's say I put them in core 143. And then maybe that last course is oceanography, which is not a core course. That would be a course that would go toward their major. So now we've circled all the core courses that our student is in, and here's how it works. All right, everyone takes FYF, but you're in academic writing, so like, look, 
you're completing academic writing. So we're gonna just strike through this just like that. And also this version of academic writing fulfills the core value of thoughtful stewardship. So we put a check mark. Now at Core 124, you're fulfilling natural scientific inquiry. You only need one of these, right? One and done. So you are done with core science and also you have fulfilled the core value requirement of transformative learning. And we have you in statistics, so you are fulfilling your core requirement for quantitative reasoning and you have fulfilled the core value requirement of respectful and inclusive community. So now what do we have left? We have oral communication, social science, creativity, social cultural history, and ethics. And you need to take at least one of those under this citizenship with integrity value column. And that's how it works. So I know it's a little bit um, elementary school, the circles and the strike marks and the check marks, but like, honestly, this is magic. When I sit down with a student, and draw the circles and do the strike marks and do the check marks, then we get it. Okay, now I understand what I'm doing. Now that student is empowered to go for and figure out from this point how they want to fulfill the rest of those core values, um, core literacies, because um, one thing we really want students to appreciate about the core is that they have, like Dr. Keaton said, an immense, immense amount of choice within each of those categories. So it's not like there's just one single class that we have offered that allows them to meet the core literacy of social cultural inquiry. This is it, this is your social cultural inquiry course. No, we have like, what, at least, I wanna say 20 versions of social and cultural inquiry courses that they can choose from in any semester. And out of that 20, they need one, one and done. And so what happens if a student takes two in one semester from respectful and inclusive community? Like, is that setting them up in a bad way or, or what? <laughs> no, because we have nine literacies but only four core values. So a student needs to take at least one course for each literacy. Along the way, we want them to distribute those nine courses across our four core values, but inevitably they will double up on a core value here and there, and that is totally fine. So by way of, of like filling in a little bit, um, adding a little bit of color to that, to that, uh, to that picture, if you look, for example, at the ethical reasoning core literacy, you can see that there's four different numbers listed, right? 181, 182, 183, 184. And you might be thinking you have to take one or the other of those, but you don't. You take any one of those, as Dr. Thweet explained, and you get circled and you completed that literacy. So for example, uh, just to give an example of what that might look like, a core 181 class might have a title called something like living in a digital world. It might have a title like how to citizen. Um, those are different class titles with different themes, but they each uh, satisfy the core 181 catalog number. And that means they are the ethical reasoning literacy and also the value pathway of citizenship. Dr. Tweed, if you could go back to the chart, um, uh, I would, it, I... it would kind of show what I'm, Uh, describing. So then Core 182, under Core 182, the titles might be something like, remember, this is thoughtful stewardship, which sounds a bit like environmentalism, right? And ethical reasoning. So you might have a class titled uh, environmental ethics, or you might have a class titled um, ethics of preservation. That would be Core 182. Under Core 184, we have a class that's very, very popular called uh, A Life Well Lived in which we have two professors of religion and philosophy who talk with their students about different philosophies of what it means to live a good life. And the student takes that class, it'll circle the core 184 thing. And they will have, once again, that satisfies ethical reasoning. So we would just cross that out with Dr. Tweet and put a check mark if we take core 184 under transformative learning. So each one of those numbers you see there can have beneath it a wide variety of titles, but it's the number to focus on when you're thinking about how the chart works. So yeah. 
filling in the connection between the themes and the and the actual catalog numbers there. Oh, and so, here Dr. Thweet has the list. Yes. So these are our current um, core 180s for the fall. Um, so you can see that students have just an immense amount of choice um, in how they want to fulfill that particular academic literacy. And also, they don't have to fulfill that particular literacy in the fall. They can do it in the spring or they can do it next year. Um, we don't really have any particular order to the way in which they need to navigate the core other than they must take first year seminar in their first semester, and we do want them to complete academic writing in their first year. And if they're in, if they're headed toward a major that has further math requirements, we do want them to be taking their math um, early rather than late. Very good. Um, how fast should a student complete this entire chart? Like, is it important to do that in the first year? How, how quickly should they do it, do you think? Are you asking me? Sure, Dr. Thweet. Um, well, we can see I here. It's nearly <laughs> impossible not to be done um, by the end of your second year. Um, if you are taking a good mix of core courses and major and minor courses, um, starting in the first semester and moving forward from there, um, you're done by your second year. It's very rare that a student is juggling so many different kinds of requirements that for spills over into their junior year. I've seen it once. So, um, if you do two or three core courses every semester, you are finished with core um, by the end of your sophomore year. So it's worth mentioning that it's actually more efficient and quicker than, a, let's say, an average general education program at a college or university. It's probably fair to say that there's about three semesters worth of genetic courses at most schools, and we have something closer to two semesters worth of core courses at our school to complete the genetic program, which leaves more room for choosing majors and minors and taking electives and so on, which is cool. Uh, we did Dr. have Bigley. one question that came in. You just mentioned mentioned majors and minors, so I apologize for interrupting again. But is there an extra fee if a student decides to take a minor on top of their major? No, not at all. And so there was a very so, strong no. <laughs> so uh, the general idea is every student has to complete what we call 120 credit hours, which is standard. That's a normal thing. It equates to about 40 classes, four zero classes. About 10 of those classes will be core classes. The remaining 30 classes will be in majors and minors. And how you spread out that distribution is up to the student. That's part of the, the freedom of college. Um, so you can see by having 10 classes for us rather than 15 classes, let's say, for a standard university system, that leaves five more slots that you can fill in with majors and minors rather than devoted to gen ed. Uh, which is pretty cool when you're designing your your journey. Um, Dr. Vigliotti, I wonder if you could say something about that thing in the middle there. It says flagship yeah. sitting between the second and third year. You just have, you you do lots of these and you do adventurous things around the world with this flagship stuff. Could you say a word about that? Yeah, so flagship is one of, um, one of the signature programs here at the college. It stands for the Flagler Sophomore High Impact Practice Program. And these courses take place at two times during the year, um, and they take place during the student's sophomore year. So we have something called a J-term, which is a two-week intensive, um, the so their January of their sophomore year, or May master, which is a three-week term at the end of their sophomore year. And students have the ability to select really innovative, immersive classes that get students thinking about the way that the things that they're learning connect outside of the classroom. So I'm gonna use um, my own flagships as examples. I run a class in town uh, that looks at how St. Augustine's historical narrative is presented through museums. So students go to museums and we look at how things are labeled, what history is being presented, what history is being left out. And then the students are tasked with uh, offering to the institutions that uh, we visit a kind of analysis of 
what's working really well and what's being left out. And they present that actually to the executive directors of the museums. Um, but flagship also takes place in places like London, or um, I co-led a flagship two years ago or a year ago to the Azores with Dr. Brenda Kaufman, who's the director of the flagship program to look at uh, ecotourism and sustainability in the Azores. So we went to a number of local farms, learned about their practices, um, how different tour companies operate and what they do to be sustainable. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for students to have this um, experience that connects their learning to the lived world. Um, students really love flagship. Dr. Thweet also has a really interesting flagship um, that takes place on campus too. Um, if you want to well, share Well, thanks. Um, Y'all will have to stop me because, you know, um, this is my thing and I'll talk about it. Uh, so I also run a, a local flagship, um, which means that there are no sort of extra fees attached to it. Um, when students want to do a flagship that involves travel, there is the travel expense um, that has to be considered. Um, but when you stay put, um, you don't have to do that. So um, my uh, flagship theme actually incorporates childbirth um, and uh, justice issues in healthcare surrounding childbirth, both in the U.S. but also globally. Um, and uh, you might not guess, but there are at least 15 students out there at Flagler College who are just absolutely gung-ho about learning all there is to know about childbirth and to spend <laughs> two weeks um, in the J-term um, exploring that. Um, it was a fabulous experience this past January. Um, had a really great group of students. They were um, brave and willing to bond and participate and explore. And we actually culminated our class with an on-campus event that reached way outside of the January term. This took place in February. And I said to them, look, I can't require you to do this as part of your flagship course because this is in February. So if you want to help me put on this event to teach the rest of campus about social justice around childbirth issues, then please join me. And at least half of them showed up as volunteers for no reason other than they just wanted to. Um, and that was pretty special. So the flagship class is what we call a rite of passage class between the first half and the second half of the student's college career. And it kind of, it's like an inflection point. It, it marks the moment where the student has learned how to be a college student, has learned the basic skills of the core system. And as Dr. Vigliotti said, well, now is now taking the chance to take those skills and that, and that knowledge base and apply it somewhere in the world, either locally or globally, either with travel or with intensive study on campus or with study in the community. And that sets them up with confidence uh, for success in the second half as they really begin to work intensively in their majors and minors and begin to do internships and get ready for life after college. So the flagship is a program we're really proud of. Uh, just to give one final example, I taught my first flagship actually just now in May, and it was all around the idea of video game design. So I myself, I'm not a video game designer, I'm a philosopher, but as a hobby, um, I've learned how to program and do 3D modeling and so on. So in the computer lab, I had my 15 students designing 3D models and doing basic computer programming animation and learning about how video games can convey the experience of different kinds of people to us as players. Uh, in ways differently than films can, in ways differently than novels can. So we talked about the difference between those different kinds of art forms. And I showed students that programming and 3D modeling and animation are things that they can do, that even if it's not going to be their career, it's a part of the world that could be made uh, available to them and it's something they see that they can do for themselves. And they really had a great time with it. So it was really fun for me, and I, I think it was really fun for them too. Um, Just one final so thing about flagship before Please. we move on. Um, much like the core system, the breadth of offerings for the May Mester and J term is huge. Things change every year and we have a fair where students are able to kind of walk around to the different professors and learn about like, what does this flagship offer? What's the, is there any associated cost with travel? Um, and there's just an incredible amount of choice and um, 
students really are excited by that variety and opportunity. So good. So yeah, let's let's talk about that schedule a little bit. The general idea is a student will choose their flagship in the first April that they are citizens at Flagler. So if your student is coming here this fall, they will pick, they will choose the flagship course they're going to take in their first April here. They will then take it about a year later, either in January or in May of their second year. So in between there, they've got six months to get get excited, get ready for their flagship, which may involve travel, may involve going to Japan or Africa, may involve just staying right here at home, but in any case involves an intensive experience. Um, and the opportunity to choose is itself actually a pretty exciting deal, as Dr. Vigliotti said. We do set out in the library a whole array of our professors at tables with like brochures and uh, other kinds of uh, literature to explain what their different flagship experiences will be like. And then the students have a chance to like look at the different options, think about cost, if there's any cost associated with it, talk with their families about it and make a decision about what they want to do and then uh, sign up for their flagship and then take it about, as I say, about a year later. Um, does the flagship yes. program have to coincide with a major or minor? Like, does the topic have to relate at all? So Dr. Thweet, okay. which is... <laughs> Um, no, and in fact, we we really encourage students to take this as an opportunity to branch out and experience something new or go to a new place where they have not been before, um, learn a skill that they don't already possess. Um, and students do, I think, welcome that opportunity. So, you know, we have flagships that are based on um, the skill of photography, and you do not need to be an art major to sign up for that um, photography-based flagship. Um, the same for Dr. Vigilati's history court, uh, flagship in St. Augustine. You do not need to be a history major or minor for that. Um, so just like all of the other core courses, um, there are no prerequisites to this. Um, we want these to be open to any student who is interested. And it's probably a really good idea for our families and students to have a discussion about what that uh, future investment could look like, because it could be a fantastic and exciting opportunity to study abroad, but that will come with a bit more planning ahead of time. It's not to say that they're better or worse. They're, they're going to be different kinds of experiences than those that are here on campus or local in town, um, but just good planning ahead of time. If we want to travel all the way to Africa, <laughs> that's going to be a bit more involved. Yes, I do want to say I often um, hear the question from students like during roar up sessions when we talk about flagship and we get really excited about all of the travel. Um, they want to make sure that this isn't their only um, option for study abroad and that is absolutely right. Flagship is one way that you can travel and study, but it is not the only study abroad opportunity that Flagler offers. We offer several different kinds of opportunities to travel and study abroad. So maybe doing a travel flagship isn't the way you want to incorporate that experience into um, your Flagler education, but that's okay. There are multiple ways to do that. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, for folks who are interested in travel, but may be worried about the cost of the travel, we do have scholarship opportunities for uh, traveling flagships that you, that students can learn more about at the flagship that I mentioned and that uh, we're happy to answer questions about uh, at any time. I think, are we ready to dive into first year seminar and the common read? I, we've got a question about that and then a couple other questions that came in. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about first year seminar and the common read. So uh, first year, some I'll just start off. First year seminar is the class that all of our our new students who are just coming from high school take in their first semester. So it's it's the class that all of our new students have in common. Uh, when your students move into dorms, when they start to get to know other new students at Flagler, when they move here, the thing they will all have in common is they're all taking first year seminar. And this is a three credit hour class, like any other class that comes with a letter grade. So it's a real class. Uh, the point of it, as you can see here, is to set students up for success as college students. It's a class about being a college student is one is the first thing it's about. 
So you can see here, the point of it is to make connections both with other students and also learn how to make connections with offices on campus. That is to say, learn the students learn how to empower themselves by overcoming, let's say, anxiety or nervousness about going to the registrar's office, going to the counseling services offices, going to the career uh, services offices, going to the case offices, where these all, all these folks, all these Flagler staff are there for them to make their college journey easier and better. And in the first year seminar class, we introduce them to those different places that are there to set the students up, as I say, for success. We also explore St. Augustine. We walk around this beautiful historical town that Dr. Vigliotti can tell us more about. Uh, we also have stuff about like how to take notes, how to worry about how to uh, make sure we're doing a good job of time management, which is often a major concern that students have when they come from high school to college. And things like that, we help them, we set them up for college success. The other side of it, sort of the other side of the coin of first year seminar is a more, let's say, standard college class experience where we introduce students to the idea of classical and liberal education by introducing them to some deep readings that we do in the first year seminar class. Our hope is that these things work together. So for example, we read a text from 2000 years ago by Aristotle about different kinds of friends and different kinds of friendship. And then we talk amongst ourselves about the kinds of experiences we're having in our dorms as we get to know each other. And we see, what did Aristotle say, have to say about this 2,000 years ago? Does it still seem to apply today? And of course it does, because human nature doesn't change that much over the years. Uh, we're all kind of the same under the surface. And so our hope is that the classical old fashioned readings, as well as modern readings, uh, do a good job of marrying with the experience of going through this transition that a lot of our students are going through together. Um, Dr. Thuy, Dr. Vigilati, do you have anything else you'd like to say about the first year seminar class and what it tries to do for our students? Do you want to go first, Jen? Uh, sure. I was waiting for you, but okay. Um, <laughs> so hard on Zoom to tell. A first year seminar is one of my favorite things. I think it's the first thing I want to say about it. Um, I've taught at least one section of first year seminar every year that I've been at Flagler, except for one, uh, which was last year. And last year I kept forgetting I wasn't teaching it. And I kept making lesson plans in my head and then remembering that I wasn't going to get to use them because I wasn't, wasn't running a first year seminar section in the fall. Um, and that felt really strange. So I'm looking forward to getting back to it. Um, I do think that the kind of symmetry of these goals the way they reinforce each other is really important. Um, we want students to be introduced to the larger project of college um, in a way that is both challenging and supporting in equal measure. We want them to, to grasp that there is a kind of academic transition that we're asking them to step out and make, right? Um, with their writing, with their reading, with their analytical skills with their argument, right? And we work very explicitly in that skill set in first year seminar. And we are asking them to do that, right? To rise to that challenge. Um, but we're not just picking your precious children up and chucking them in the deep end and letting them sink or swim. The other part of first year seminar is we're asking you to meet us up here. Now, let me pull you up here. And then you can stand up here with me and look around and you can see things in a new way and you can articulate thoughts in a new way. Um, so these two goals support and challenge, right? Setting up students for success, but also starting in a serious and earnest way, the work of classical and liberal core education, these things actually mutually reinforce each other. They're not intention. They're really kind of pointing the students toward success together. Um, I really believe that that works. Um, and it's a lot of fun to watch students in that first semester move through this, you know, very sort of typical arc, right? They, they land in the classroom in the first week and they're like really thrilled to be in college. And then the beginning of week three, they're like, oh, I'm terrified. Like the thrill is gone and the terror has set in. And then you just sort of 
help them walk through that emotional arc to a point in the semester where they've demonstrated to themselves, I did the thing I didn't think I could do. And when a student reaches that point in the first semester, then they know they have earned the confidence they're feeling. And they take that confidence with them through the rest of their college career. That's what we want first year seminar to do for our students. Yeah, I just want to kind of reinforce what you said. Um, it is an it is truly like a foundational course in so many ways because it teaches students how to be successful in our context. We get to connect them to the different offices that they need to um, thrive here. But then we also get to do the really fun thing, which is teach them how to or deepen their ability to critically think. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciate about first year seminar, I was a first generation college student. So this class, I think, is really helpful um, for students that maybe are also coming to college without having had a syllabus before. So we have the ability to talk through, like, what is a syllabus? How do you find things on Canvas? All this kind of hidden curriculum of college that um, there's not really another place for. And then we get to have really great discussions about things like the common read, which is a really central part to first year seminar. What an amazing segue, Jeanette. <laughs> so wonderful, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Vignam, for that transition. Uh, so the common read, every year, here's what that is. Every year, the faculty select a book that they would like for their for our incoming class to read as a community. So in the past, we've had books like Into the Wild, uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God, just a variety of different kinds of books. And this year, the book we've chosen is a book called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by the author Gabrielle Zevin, which was a world, which currently still is, but has been for a, about a year now, a worldwide bestseller, you know, soon to be a motion picture, that kind of worldwide bestseller that uh, has gotten these rave reviews and is about these deep and engaging issues that we think speak speak very well to the college experience and to what the students will be uh, looking forward to, fearing, and also hoping as they, as they go through college. So this book, uh, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, is the story of a boy and a girl who become friends, lifelong friends, when they're children and then meet again in college. Uh, they then uh, form a video game company together straight out of college and to their surprise become uh, world famous because the first game that their company produces is like a, a surprise hit and takes the world by storm. And that fame and that transition from childhood to college to fame disrupts their lives and affects their friendship in ways that are um, unexpected and uh, on occasion endearing, you find them both endearing, you find them infuriating, um, and all the different kinds of choices they make. And then eventually their dreams come true, but they find out that their dreams, that our dreams are never quite exactly what they, what we thought they were going to be. Um, it's one of the messages of the novel. It's also just a great read. Um, it's really well written and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and there's a lot of great support material. So for example, on the book's website, you can actually play some of the video games that the book describes within it. And you can make your own digital art out of the, uh, to, to look like some of the characters in the novel and so on. So I got a real kick out of showing it to some students just a little bit earlier today, actually, at Aurora Obsession. Uh, so we think it'll be a really engaging, fun read for the students. But it's also, I should emphasize, it's it's actually a good novel. This, despite all those frills, it's really just actually a well-written, good novel. So we'll get a chance to explore uh, what it means to read literature at a, at a deep level, uh, as well as have fun while doing it. So those were some of the reasons why the faculty picked this book, and we hope it'll be it'll prove to be a great choice. Um, as a final note, I should mention that the author, Gabrielle Zevin, who is currently world famous, uh, will be joining us on September 23rd. Uh, she'll be giving a lecture, signing books, and having a Q&A with the students. And so we're really excited about that. It'll be a lot of fun to host her here. So we had one um, question come yeah. through. Um, since this is the first year seminar common read, um, and you'll all be discussing different themes and things like that, do those themes carry through their entire time here at Flagler? Is it really just a, a book that is concentrated during the first year seminar? Will they see this again at another point? 
So The Common Read is a book that uh, is used through the first semester primarily because it's the common read of all the first year seminar classes. There's basically two books that every first year seminar class has in common, The Common Read, this book, and we also have a first year seminar reader, which is it, and there, Dr. Thweet's holding them up. The, the reader is a special Flagler book that we publish ourselves that has a lot of readings that we use in our first year seminar classes, like that Aristotle thing I mentioned earlier. And then against that, we read Tomorrow and Tomorrow, Tomorrow, uh, in this case, in this case, for for this year, uh, do the themes travel throughout the, the the whole four years? In one sense, absolutely, because the one of the things that first year seminar is intended to convey is the idea of what is meant by a Flagler education, as described by the core values that Dr. Thweet discussed earlier. Uh, we imbue our classes with those values. Our first year seminar discussion is about those values. What does it mean to thoughtfully steward the world we live in? What does it mean to create a respectful community? And so on. And so we look for and find those themes in the books that we read, including the novel. And that is a project that we continue throughout the four years, right on into the minors and majors student take in the second half of their college career. But as to the question, is the novel itself going to reappear? No, not not necessarily. Um, some professors may may you know know their students have read it and so bring it up in their classes, but uh, not in a programmatic way. No. So I know we're getting close to the end, and we do have just a couple questions that have come through. Um, so I want to make sure that that we get to those. Going back to um, the core classes, can students request certain classes? And yes or no, how do they go about that? Is it just an email? Um, so Dr. Yes. Tweet. <laughs> yes, they can. Um, one way to do that is to um, complete that schedule survey that we send out to our incoming students. Um, we send that out really promptly after a student has completed the mass placement process. Um, but if, um, if that link got lost, sometimes it goes to spam folders, sometimes students have um, trouble finding it, um, they can simply email their case advisor. Um, if they're not sure who that is yet, um, fair, they can email our general case office email, which is our initials, C-A-C-E at flagler.edu. Um, and then we will get that to the appropriate assigned advisor and they'll take it from there. And another question, you mentioned math placement. If a student took that, I guess within the past two weeks, when will those schedules be released to them? Um, we will be releasing our next batch of schedules July 22nd. All right. Um, and then, um, Jeanette, would you mind letting us know again the approximate dates for those flagship experiences that you were sharing earlier? Um, for like or the, at least the time frame that yes. they typically happen. Yeah. So in the the fair, we usually do in April of the first year, but the classes will take place the sophomore year during January after New Year's, but before spring semester starts, and or in May right after spring semester ends. Um, there's a three-week period during their sophomore year. And then I know, um, Doug, you had mentioned scholarships for some of those study abroad trips, um, but we may need to direct families to connect with their financial aid counselor on whether financial aid specifically covers those, or can any of you speak to that? So there's an application process that students are introduced to during the flagship fair on which they essentially... Um, fill out an application for scholarship funds for the travel courses, the travel versions of the flagship courses, if they'd like to do them. Uh, and then our financial aid people, um, if they can determine need, these are need-based scholarships, uh, they issue those scholarships pretty rapidly uh, toward the uh, end of April and into May. So students will know if they have the uh, additional funds provided by a scholarship before they have to make a decision about what kind of flagship course they want to take. That's the idea. Okay. So a couple important dates, and some have already been mentioned here. Um, August 26th for Welcome Week, we have a couple sessions that are specific to this topic. Uh, we'll have an academic session and major meetup on August 26th. 
On August 29th, we'll be visiting with you all again and hopefully some students to provide a student panel on their experience with core classes and kind of unearthing some of those truths so that students can hear from students and what it was like to go through the core program. September 3rd is that ad drop deadline. So if you haven't had a chance to connect with our case office or a case advisor on changing some of those schedules, they'll be able to do that when they arrive in August, but then September 3rd is that deadline. And then as Doug mentioned, September 23rd is when our Common Read author will be on campus to connect with students. And that's been a tradition now where we've been able to connect the students with the author. And so what an exciting experience to read about it and then to, to connect with them. Um, and a couple other reminders, I will make sure to send out another um, link with the recordings from the past and our upcoming ones. We're going to take the week of July 4th off and hope that everybody has a wonderful holiday, but our next webinar will be July 9th, where we'll be chatting with our student leadership and engagement and campus recreation teams on just getting involved in campus and what is what is here? What is waiting for you? Um, email and phone or phone or is email best? Probably email is best at this point with everybody's summer schedules. And so if you need to connect with any of these offices, this is going to be the best contact information. And then exciting for all of us, today was our first day for our first Roar Up orientation session. And so we still have spots left through our uh, remaining sessions throughout the month of July. So we hope that you'll join us and connect on campus, connect with other students, get to meet with us in person. Um, but a big thank you to our panelists tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. And if anybody has any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So hope you all have a wonderful evening. Happy 4th of July, and we look forward to seeing you soon.